welcome to this very special show, the Fund Manager Special on Diwali. Happy Diwali to all our viewers and we're here with me is Nimesh Shah. We're here uh, at the NSC. We have a bunch of um, veteran market experts with us to tell us what's on your mind this Diwali. So let me introduce all of them. We have Nilesh Shah, Manish Kunwani and Navneet Manon. Gentlemen, happy Diwali to all of you. Nilesh, uh, since equities have not given us any returns this year, are you buying gold for your wife this Diwali? No. I am anti-gold. I think whole of India has bought more gold than what is needed. And hence, I am avoiding buying gold. More importantly, equities have become cheaper. Because they haven't given any return last Diwali, it's quite likely that this Diwali they will give better return. So it's time to buy equity rather than gold. Okay, so there is a Diwali sale as uh, they're calling it in the equities, in the equity markets. Navneet, uh, happy Diwali to you. You were telling us before the show started that, you know, this is the best time to be buying. But sentiment has really been punctured. How do you change that? So that's the best time to buy, right? When sentiments are not good. When sentiments are good, last year at this point in time, we were celebrating implementation of GST, of IBC, of RERA. Uh, we were celebrating, I think, the, the expectation of growth coming back next year, corporate profitability coming back. But because of all of these things, valuations were also high, right? So last Diwali, sentiments were better, but the valuations were high. This time, maybe some of the risks that we thought last year, whether it's from trade war, from global monetary tightening, or the high oil prices, the valuations have come down. And that's why, like Nilesh mentioned, that we are not buying gold. I'm putting more money in equities. Okay. In uh, equity mutual fund, specifically <laughs> SPI mutual fund. So, happy Diwali. Happy Diwali to all the guests as well. Uh, you know, I, just to take a point forward, uh, Navdeet, you spoke about valuations getting correct in a bit. But have they come to a, a, a decent, a, 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 like a buy zone right now? Or you think still feel there is froth simply because uh, the earnings have not picked up in the last four years. Earnings have been flat, but the valuations have reached almost 21, 22x. Still, there is a room for correction. So there is a fallacy of average. You put a person in half in a deep freeze and half in oven and say, say that the average temperature is, is not worrisome. The same thing with the market. Whether you look at the valuations or you look at earnings growth, it's a very, very similar story. There are pockets where the valuations are high. There are pockets. And I think today those pockets have become large where valuations have become reasonable if you take a slightly longer term view. Okay. Uh, Manish, uh, uh, I was just listening to your uh, video as well, where you spoke about broad outlook for in the near term. And you, even you believe that you know it's right time to look at equities as an asset class vis-a-vis vis vis the other asset classes. Uh, your take on, on equity as an asset class, within that, what is your view on the mid-cap and small-cap? Because they are the ones who have corrected sharply. So I think there are two ways to look at it. Uh, in terms of historical attractiveness, I think we are somewhere in between. Okay. So rather than take a subjective opinion, if you look at our asset allocation model or other asset allocation models in the industry. Everyone is in the middle zone. So I think neither are we in 2009 or 2013 kind of bottom. I don't think we are at 2010 or 2008 kind of top as well. So we're somewhere in the middle. Um, of course, just to buttress what Navneet was saying, I think there's fair amount of value because I think what's interesting is even globally, if you see, uh, 2011 to 17 was broadly a growth style working over value style. But I think over the last few months, we're starting to see, uh, after a fairly long period of time, uh, the value style come back. So if you see the FANG stocks also have started sure. correctly, yeah. whereas the traditional old economy stocks have started doing well globally. So I think there is a trend towards value and I think uh, over the last six, seven years, a lot of the asset-based industries Companies which are close to book value, though that's quite cheap right now because they haven't gone anywhere for the last five, six years. Okay. Nilesh, what about you? What's your view? Because a lot of people are drawing parallels to the 2013 kind of uh, scenario. If that is the case, then this is perhaps the best time to be buying stocks. Would you agree with that argument? So, this is the best time to buy the stock provided we are lucky and we are sensible. We need a little bit of luck in terms of oil prices. Oil prices have come down from 80 to 75 and our markets are up 4%. Small cap is up even more. So we need oil to go towards 70 and then to 60. Then this is the best time to buy. We also need to be sensible. There are state elections towards the end of the year. There is mother of all general elections in 2019 mid. Clearly market has priced in a stable government. 
And if we get a coalition government, then this is not the time to buy equity. But if you are going to get a stable government, then this is the time to buy the equity. So we need to be lucky a little bit. We need to be sensible in voting majority. So you're saying that because there is a, an election coming up, there could be a lot of uncertainty that perhaps the worst is not over, you think? So it is a binary event. If we get a stable government, markets will continue to rise further. If we get a scenario where no one can form a government, then un undoubtedly markets will correct. Now, if you again see over a longer term, does election matter to the market? Not much. In 2004, markets corrected on election results day. But after that, unleashed the mother of the bull market from 2004 to 2008. In 2009, markets went up 20% in a day post-election result. But thereafter, for next five years, nothing much happened. So over a longer period of time frame, it really doesn't matter what election results are. But on the day of the elections, you could be rich by 20% or poor by 20%, yeah. depending upon how you have voted. Uh, Nilesh, uh, you know, for keeping the fundamentals aside, what is the retail sentiment indicator suggesting you? Because last year, same time last year, you said retail investors were advising you what to buy and what not to sell. This time, I'm sure nobody's asking for an advice as to what to buy. What, are the, what is that indicator suggesting you at this point in time? So this time, my feeling is that when I go to Lakshmi Puja and in my relative's house, I will be probably be cornered into a room saying that yahan pe baitha ro, kuch karna mat. <laughs> Clearly, people have lost money in small and mid cap and micro cap and mini cap stocks. Uh, the good part is that in market there are now matured people. So they have bought good quality companies. They have continued to invest throughout the downturn. They have used SIP to invest. They have followed by and large asset allocation. But in the same market, there are many newcomers who have tried to trade in IPO, who have tried to trade in Dabba market, Grey market, who have tried to invest in all those companies whose name I don't remember, whose name I have never known. So those guys have lost money. But by and large, matured investors have behaved quite nicely. And it is on their flows and their stability that we are seeing today's market getting settled. Okay. Actually, you know, I saw Navneet nod his head quite a bit when you said that you're going to get ostracized from family events, especially Diwali, etc. Navneet, is that the feeling? Is there a loss of confidence amongst retail investors? Or is there still faith that this is, you know, just a correction in a bull market and retail sentiment is still intact? I think uh, retail investors in India have shown huge resilience. I think despite the volatility that we have seen since the beginning of the year, Rising SIP flows clearly indicate that investors are taking longer term view. I think they are a lot more disciplined than what we think about the retail investors. And of course, a lot of credit goes to our advisors, to, to the people like you and to the industry also in terms of promoting the whole concept of mutual fund Sahi Hai. And people are taking a view that Sahi Hai but for long term but with a disciplined approach. And that's clearly reflecting in the discipline in the SIP flows and the pension fund flows that are coming to us. Uh, Manish, uh, before I ask you all about individual sectors and, and how to approach this market from here on, first, a little bit on the global market, global setup as well. Uh, you know, every second day, I, I think right now, the way to look at global market is look at what Trump is going to tweet and what other, other players are going to tweet. Broadly, what is the global setup looking to you like? Are, are we in a sweet spot? or think there is, there is going to be a bit of an accident in the global markets as well? Personally, I feel from a global perspective, we are getting into a sweet spot. So my simple framework is India does well when either uh, US is not doing too well or not doing too badly. Okay. If US is an extreme, what happens is if US is doing too well, the dollar is too strong. Right. If US is doing too badly, the world is in a recession. So you don't want both of that. So I think what's happening is the pendulum is moving from US doing too well to somewhere in between because the dollar seems to be peaking out. I think uh, the expectations of US growth today are so high and they are entering a phase where they will have fiscal tightening related to what was happening this year. They will have monetary tightening and they have currency tightening because the currency has tightened. So in that sense, given all these headwinds, I would expect that the US will slow down next year or somewhere close to that. And therefore, you might see the dollar weakening a bit. So I think the pendulum is kind of moving in India's favor at this point of time. Okay.
Okay, so since the consensus here, Talk yeah, go ahead. Some interesting thing. In 1984, India and China were of similar size. Today, they are seven times bigger than us. In 24 years, they have dropped us by seven times. They become manufacturer to the world. We didn't. But now, due to tariff for, due to cost increase in China, due to their stringency on pollution, the manufacturing base is shifting. There was an economist article which said computers are going to Taiwan, electronics going to Thailand, Malaysia, footwear going to Cambodia, clothing going to Bangladesh, and food processing going to Vietnam. I wish this is our opportunity where all of this can come to India. Yeah. And uh, we have seen that in inor inorganic chemical industries where growth is more than 40% year-on-year year for last three quarters. In mobile handsets, we are seeing now production happening in India. So if we can take advantage of the supply chain disruption, it is like what Y2K did to Indian IT. Today, we are number one IT services provider in the world. The same thing can happen on manufacturing side if we can take advantage of the supply chain disruption. But do you think that's just going to remain a dream? Because I know our, in the ease of doing business, our ranking has moved up. But still, there are so many regulatory hurdles that businessmen and the industrialists talk about. Uh, you think it's going to take a long while before so any of this happens? I was in US very recently, and we manage India's one of the largest offshore small and mid-cap fund. And obviously, in dollar terms, fund hasn't done that well. But none of the customer complained to me. And I was like tech, talking to my sales guy saying that you are doing a great job in customer servicing. No one complained. And they said very plainly, sir, don't give any credit to us. Others have fallen so much more that our fall is not looking like. <laughs> so we are talking always focused on India. We have this hurdle, that hurdle. Please go and try to file income tax return in United States of America and you will realize filing Indian IT return is much, much simpler. Okay, the eternal optimist, right? <laughs> so, okay. Um, Namdeet, uh, the other big sector which is in the limelight and which has been talked about very largely of late is the entire NBFC stroke housing finance space. We've seen a bit of a liquidity crisis in that space. Looks like you know, there are, there are real, real attempts being made uh, you know, to, to resolve this liquidity crisis. What do you make of the whole crisis? And B, is this crisis giving you a lot of opportunity to invest into the NBFC and housing space? So structurally, given some of the powerful forces in financial services, disintermediation, digitalization, differential regulation, and you also add some of the things that have been happening in India in terms of formalization of the economy, financialization of savings, financialization of assets, household savings, households borrowings were low, and that's why there was a huge opportunity for the whole NBFC, HFC space. With the added liquidity advantage, particularly post-demand, they have grown much faster. But I strongly believe in capital cycle, much more than an economic business profit cycle. Too much of capital chasing a particular sector can lead to some issues. We have seen that. Structurally, if you ask me, there's still a lot of opportunities for a lot of non-banking entities. But at least for some time, I think the banks who lost market share, for them there is a lot of opportunities. They have a better liability side. They can gain on multiple fronts, including lending to these NBFCs at better pricing. They can buy portfolios at a good price and they can regain the market share from these entities. So I think banks are going to be a big beneficiary, but well-run NBFCs and HFCs who have a good liability side, good risk management, underwriting standards, recovery mechanism, they will also do well. There is a lot of opportunity in India. Well, let's take a short break on that note, but don't go anywhere. A rapid fire round coming up with the top fund managers of the country and lots more market chatter. Stay tuned.